My name is Mark Zarin. I work for VMware in our Boston office. Um, and today I'm going to be basically giving you an experience report um, from part of my development experience over the last couple of years at VMware. The talk is titled Why OS Matters, but not necessarily why you think it does. Um, first of all, I have to give credit to one of our fellows at VMware, Ola Agassin, who um, it, this, this whole topic is really his brainchild, and today I'm presenting data that he gathered. Um, and so, you know, everything interesting and uh, fascinating about this talk, you know, credit to him and everything kind of dubious, credit to me. Um, standard disclaimers apply. Um, so, VMware, you know, has been around for a while, and there was definitely a period where we were a fast growth company, um, and we had products where we added tons and tons of features all the time, um, and that meant we added tons of code to these products, and we not unusually underallocated time for tech debt and cleanup for some of these products. Um, and we ended up in this situation where we would never <coughs> remove code. Um, and because in this case we're talking about a C++ application, it actually grew to be pretty impressively big. Um, so the, the growth of the, I'm going to be talking about one particular product today, it's kind of uh, anonymized, um, but the data is real. Uh, and it, the, growth, the growth curve looked like this. You can imagine just sort of endless growth of, in this case, this is the size of a binary. So as an engineer working on this project, we don't really see this, we don't, we don't see this line, right? What, the way we experience it as, we experience it as the code being brittle um, and sometimes underperforming and also, make, and also being somewhat hard to understand. Um, so like typical behavior is that a contributor comes into the code base, adds a feature and then ducks and then runs off to implement <laughs> another feature. So uh, I think probably this is a familiar software life cycle to many people in the room. Um, and uh, at some point though, this particular binary that we're talking about today became a mature product at VMware. So the rate of addition slowed down somewhat. Um, uh, and really what happened was the, the, new, the, the big new value in the company was happening outside of this particular product slash binary, and, the, mo and um, the most important thing to do was to make this thing better at what it was doing. So the thing that was in our way was actually the complexity that had developed over that initial decade of development. <coughs> and, um, so we were all very much motivated to solve this problem, but there were many different ways that people wanted to attack the problem and many options. And doing something and making forward progress required staffing, leadership, and some kind of developer workflow um, to make that progress. Um, and so we had kind of hit this classic problem in software engineering, which is the herding problem. How do you herd your cats, right? So um, how do you get a bunch of developers to collectively make forward progress on a complex problem with lots of solutions? And one answer to the problem is you give them some metrics to drive against. So this is really, this is really Ola's insight and his brainchild is picking a metric to drive against this, the the dominating concern for the product, which, which was the complexity of the code base. So, of course, we already measure uh, other metrics like operations per seconds, resources required for each operation, the max capacity of the system, the uptime of the system, et cetera. And we have micro benchmarks too, and coverage, et cetera, et cetera. But these metrics do not necessarily drive a decrease in complexity. Uh, Maybe coverage, because you can delete code and increase your coverage, right? Um, but definitely some of those metrics dri actually drive an increase in complexity of the product. Um, and also, some of those metrics are only available really after relatively long um, tests. Uh, it might be an hour or it might be a day. 
Um, but they're, they're not, they're sometimes difficult to acquire metrics. Um, and the question was, what metrics do we pick to incentivize the complexity reduction? And also, can we find a metric that applies at every single commit so that this becomes part of the developer workflow? So this is binary size. And basically, Ole said, guys, let's go fix this. Let's change the slope of this line. Guys and, guys and girls. Um, so the way it worked, tech, like procedurally, was here's my change, my change uh, review, that's, or my change description that's going out for review. And I say, I did some little cleanup, and I ran the unit tests. Um, and then at the bottom of the review, I say, and this is what happened to the binary. So this is the mechanic that Ole gave us. And he just started doing this without necessarily just, just started doing it. Um, and the way this worked is that you would have basically multiple copies of the source tree. Um, and then you'd have multiple build outputs. And um, you would keep one source tree as your baseline. And then you'd have like <coughs> projects um, in the parallel trees. Uh, and then you would run a script that basically just wrapped Unix size and did this diff. Um, so it was extremely simple. And again, the, the goal was a simple solution that was easy to implement. If you're familiar with Unix size, it's actually kind of a very arbitrary tool. It's kind of giving you numbers that aren't necessarily exactly what you might want when you're if you really wanted to dig into the details. But that's not the point. The point was it's readily available, and it's the same for everyone, in a sense. Um, and so you make this part of your edit compile loop, not just the review cycle loop, but actually it's the same. You make it part of your edit and compile loop. And we'll talk a little bit later on about, um, oh, and then you copy and paste it into your review description. And OK, so the reactions. <laughs> Uh, which might actually be like held by some of the people in the room is really you've got to be kidding I have to like do this in every step and I have to have these parallel build directories and like this tool and um, and Yeah, no really we're we're actually pretty serious about this um, People actually keep multiple projects anyway um, and actually uh, some of the like most uh, productive individuals are always keeping multiple projects in flight. Some things might be fast, but some things might be slow, either due to test latency or due to review cycle latency, et cetera. Like you might need to review from a different time zone. So you want to keep multiple things going. Also, we wanted something that you could run locally um, so that it becomes part of your normal cycle. Um, and think of it like a unit test. Every time you make a change, you say, did my test pass? And every time you make a change, you ask, did I bloat the app? Right? Uh, and it's also part of your self-review. And ultimately, we'll talk about this a little bit later, it's part of the design of the product, for the, the, the design of the code. Yeah, go ahead, Louis. You could probably um, uh, avoid having, uh, requiring different trees by just, um, just snapshotting, snapshotting the size of your product single at each commit, and then basically the diff is just Right. So the, the comment was, um, you could probably uh, like share a, a, a cache snapshot that everyone could use for, for size changes. Actually, there was some implementation of that. It wasn't convenient in our build system, but I agree that's a logical thing to do. Um, there, it's also true that often your baseline, you might have two changes chained together, and one is the baseline for the next one. So you end up with multiple trees anyways. Um, so this is what the graph looks like in the early days. I've extended a little bit further. Um, and I guess if you look at this graph, the first thing you're going to see is you're going to see that big drop there. Um, and actually what this is is um, this is someone uh, that just like, looked at one of our class hierarchies and said, hey, all these things, they don't need to be virtual methods. I can actually just make them static, uh, you know, static members um, or regular class members. And, that, and they pulled a bunch of code out of the product by doing that. Um, and, um, but this graph doesn't really tell you like where we're starting from and where we have to go, right? So let's take a, let's take a step back and look at some bigger context for this graph. So this is zero at the bottom, and that's the little line that we had up at the top. 
Okay, so th that, and there's our little drop, right? And the drop was about a 1% change in binary size. Um, this is back in the day, we were using GCC 4.3 at 02 at this point. Um, and this is a release build, stripped binaries, and these numbers are being gathered nightly. So multiple changes can coalesce into one measurement. Um, and the span of the graph that we're going to look at is over a period of years. Okay, so um, now the next question is, we started this and we kind of, in hallway conversations, we were like, well, what are, what's it, like, where are we going? Like, how far do we think we can go, right? So what do you think we should be shooting for? 30%. Okay. <laughs> so I think the obvious one is 50% goal, right? And I, um, and I did some back of the envelope calculations. Like I said, okay, we have so many thousands of things in our RPC type system that we have to actually support on public APIs and give each one of those a few K, something like that. And I said, okay, the lower bound is probably around 40%. And so Ole said, oh yeah, yeah, that's definitely the goal then. The lower bound. <laughs> because, yeah, he was probably thinking 30%, but he was like, okay, that's good enough. I'll take that. Um, so that's kind of the context, where we're starting from and where we're going. Um, now, can anyone else, what else does someone see in this chart? What else is going on here besides that little nick in the... It's going up again over here, yeah. We'll talk about that in a minute. But what do you see? What else do you see? Yeah, Bob? What, what, what is the cause of that inflection point there in the middle? Is that what you're referring to? Well, there's an inflection point, um, there's an inflection point here, actually. Right? Why stop? Right. So that it stopped. Right? And that's because of him. Right. So <laughs> sort of single handedly he just well, he had friends, so there were a few friendly cats involved, right? But single handedly he basically said the the slope can change. Right? It's possible. Um, so now I want to describe there's sort of two different kinds of changes in this graph. One is a tooling change, right? <laughs> And a tooling change tends to be a library or a header change or a tool chain change, like a compiler that changes. Um, or we also have RPC code emitters, so those are big levers that tend to change thousands, thousands of things at once. So these tend to be, you tend to think of these as percentages of the overall binary. So a good day is half a percent, a really good day is 1%, and, and there's these crazy outliers where you can take 5% off the binary with one change. Um, so that's a tooling change. And then these, you see these as discontinuities in the graph. Um, then you have this, these, these sort of smoother changes in, in um, slope, and these are the humans. And uh, these are step-by-step -step changes. They're often very small changes. And the numbers you're looking at is like 100 <coughs> bytes here, 100 bytes there, maybe 1K on a really good day. Every once in a while, you'll find a change that like changes 20K of code. Um, what yeah. Is size? What is binary size? What, what is, where is that green line? I, the numbers are hidden from you. Yeah. Because the, they're real. But, but that's why I'm asking because 1K relative to where the green line is, it might matter and might not, right? If, it, if, that's, if that's two gigabytes, then 1K is... It actually, it actually doesn't matter because what I'm saying is what a human should put into a review is about 150 bytes to 20K. So like, that's like how much you should like, expect a reviewable piece of change to contain. So it's, that, the, the, these absolute numbers are not really, they're not really, they don't need to be uh, squared with the proportional numbers on the graph. Um, so now the team starts to gain momentum, right? <laughs> the cats are being herded. The graph starts to look like this. And I could explain a couple of points on the graph. So there's our old notch from back there, um, and some of the graph is cut off on the left. Um, and here's a compiler change, so we upgraded to GCC 4.6. Um, and then here, this is a change related to boost, and this is actually my personal first big notch on the graph. And so um, I was actually in the process of upgrading boost across a couple of versions, and I noticed that when I upgraded boost, the binary size went way up, and I was like, oh man, I am not gonna, this is gonna be hard to argue. <laughs> um, I'm gonna have to figure this out. And, but it didn't take long, just a little bit of looking around, and I discovered that we had been doing something stupid for a while, which was that we were compiling uh, with asserts on and release builds, but not actually hooked up to do anything. 
Um, so we were injecting a whole ton of code into, into the application that was just no op in the end. So all I had to do even before upgrading the boost version was just make two lines of change in our build system and that drop occurred. Um, and you know, we fiddled around with logging. We tried to take as much logging out of line as possible because you, know, you shouldn't pay for logging unless you actually use it. Um, we uh, got rid of a bunch of strings that were being uh, linked in everywhere. Uh, we removed like a third party library. We had used this third party library for years and then we stopped using it for years and then someone finally realized, oh yeah, we don't use this anymore so you can rip that entire subsystem out. <laughs> I mean, this is the kind of thing, it's like when you're working on building a feature, this is not what you're going after. But when you, the team is like looking for these big wins, these are kind of juicy targets and people take care of them in their spare time. Um, you know, this is another one where the product actually removed a service from the product and the application could remove all references to the service, right? So th there's a couple of other things going on in this graph. And um, was it Bob or uh, um, someone picked up on it before, which is that over here, there's actually this big upward slope. And so what, what's going on there? Well, that's pretty easy to explain because that was a release crunch. Everyone was like lobbing their feature over the wall, trying to get it into the release, <laughs> all right? so. And then you know, that, that goes away once the branch gets cut and you know, get back to business. And there's another thing going on here, which is really the point of this, is that we also have this much steeper downward facing uh, slope. And there's a lot of small changes involved there. So that's actually the team like, getting engaged, really, is what's happening there. So um, this is what the reviews look like going by. Everyone says, here's I'm doing this. And that's my, change. that's my size change. I'm, doing some, I'm getting rid of some uh, uh, string copies. And I save 120 bytes. Um, but every once in a while, um, you see this. I got rid of some string copies, and the binary size went up. And then you scratch your head, and you disassemble a bunch of stuff, and kind of waste a lot of time trying to figure out what the heck went wrong, right? Um, and you can see a lot of that in the graph right there. Uh, and so what do you think is going on? I made the code simpler, the binary size went up. Inlining, yeah, right. The inliner is doing whatever the heck it feels like. <laughs> you know, like a little change here, the inliner like starts inlining a lot of stuff, a little change there, decides, meh, I'll just outline it. Uh, right, so this is, uh, this makes the, this measurement that's driving this change in behavior, it makes this measurement uh, uh, less predictable and therefore less useful. So this is when Ola brings out the big hammer, right? The big hammer is, okay, we're switching from O2 to OS, right? We could actually, we should probably call it the little hammer, but, or the small hammer. Um, but, so that's, this, so this is what happens when you turn on OS, right? Like, whoop, like a giant drop in the, in the binary size, right? Um, and so, yeah, do you want no, I'll get to the green one later. Um, so the requirement here is that measure our most important problem, right? Our most important problem is complexity, right? So that's what we, we, wanna, we wanna have a good measure for that. And the rationale for compiling for size is that the binary is huge anyways, we're probably blowing out all kinds of caches in the processor, right? Um, and also we measured, like, Throughput of the application is in, the delta in throughput in the application was in noise. Of course, the micro benchmarks you can see the difference. Of course, the compilers the compilers do their job, right? But in terms of the metrics that the customers see when they're trying to actually get work done, the delta was really in the noise. Um, so, yeah, so there's our forty percent goal with this giant, and suddenly the forty percent goal is looking like a little bit conservative. Basically, you know, Ole had pulled the Kobayashi Maru on me and like totally changed the, the <laughs> rules of the game. So it looks like this is going to be an easy one to win, right? So how does the movie end? I'm going to go ahead and expand the whole graph, and of course, yeah, we get down to that forty forty percent goal over a couple of years, um, and now uh, I'm going to take a little closer look at the interesting part of the graph, right? And the first thing is the green lines that Arthur was asking about. So these are other binaries that are related to the purple binary. Um, and they start, and they get added in a little bit later. Um, and uh, 
There's also this, there's this big spike in the middle. And as far as I can tell, I think this is a data collection error. We were changing between two branches at this point and also adding the yellow line at this point, And I think the numbers are just wrong. Um, and so here's another compiler upgrade. Um, here's where we turn on C++11. Uh, that is one of the libraries we actually, after we turn on C++11, we can start using, for, um, we can start using forwarding, right? And actually, the drop in C++11 is no change to the code. Just flip the compiler switch, right? And, and you get a pretty big um, bump down in binary size. And I believe that most of that is related to eliminating copies. Uh, and so here, we actually change the way we emit code. And we start taking advantage of move. You get another big bump down in one of the libraries. Um, here, this is actually humans thinking about work. And, um, and redesigning class hierarchies in order to simplify the code. Uh, and here's a, another example where we remove some old infrastructure that we weren't using anymore. So here's another thing that's going on here. It's a little bit hard to see. It's easier to see in the library, um, but you can also see it in the application graph. Um, this is another release crunch period. So you see this kind of uptick. People are more worried about getting their feature done than they are worried about reducing complexity. But that makes sense. Um, and the, the big, and I think the most interesting thing, is this very smooth portion after we switch to C11, right? There's this, this smooth period. It includes a release cycle, but there's this, there's this kind of impressive uh, smooth curve down over a long period of time. Um, these are the happy humans <laughs> doing work. I mean, there's very little tool chain changes going on in here, right? Um, so I want to say also that during that period, um, there's actually real work happening, too. Um, you know, we're actually building, we're, we're creating value, too. We're not just like making our binary size smaller. So, you know, but what we're doing is we're doing algorithmic optimization. Uh, and you might, like if you switch on O2, you might see a 10%, I don't know, 20% on a good day kind of uh, performance improvement. But the algorithmic op optimizations are there, of course, they're giving you orders of magnitude um, when you get them right. Um, and like I said, removing, we're removing whole subsystems. Um, we're, and, and we're also adding entirely new features to the product during that, that smooth um, period. So of course, I mean, from my point of view, like I was busily working on throwing that C11 switch and very much involved in figuring out um, guidelines for using new features, et cetera. So I cared a lot about the C11 related changes that were happening during this time. One of the big ones was we were able to take a lot of out parameters and turn them into return values. Uh, we're also similarly able to take reference, uh, reference types, so things that are allocated on the heap, and change them into value types, because now they're movable. Um, another big one was that we have a lot of continuations and they were using bind um, historically. Uh, and we were able to take all, all the binds and convert them to lambdas. Uh, and it gave us a, a new syntax to learn, but it also got rid of an old syntax that was um, somewhat uh, tricky to use correctly. Obviously, range base 4. Range base 4 is actually kind of a wash in um, binary size, but definitely a code complexity um, improvement. And of course, devirtualization with final. Um, so there's, it's not just about the language feature part two. It's also, what's going on is the team is thinking about how can I take this subsystem and pull complexity out of it. Um, so simplifying class structure, we saw a bunch of examples of that. Um, removing dead features again. And another thing is that over time, when people had added features, they had added layers of indirection in the code. And maybe one feature had been uh, deprecated and removed from the product, and, but the layer of indirection had been left behind. Uh, and so there were actually some, some very significant re-engineering going on in those small changes over time, just pulling out those layers. Um, uh, also, we had at various times, someone might be, have added instrumentation for a particular problem and then just left it in there. And then, but no one was using it anymore, so we could remove that. Um, we had, um, in order to test scale, we had several systems that had built simulators in the product. Um, and we basically said, no, 
just make the product smaller and run faster and just run that stuff at scale, buy some more hardware and take that out of the product. Um, and also there is a lot of uh, work on logging. So thinking of carefully about logging, um, and logging tends to be everywhere. Uh, and this actually, you know, building up a discipline about, about this was a big part of it as well. And um, also exception, like, I, I'm not sure I agree this reduces complexity, but it definitely reduces binary size. Um, but getting helpers to build ex rich exceptions that contain a lot of information, that's because that's the way we handle rich errors in this code base. Um, et cetera. So um, this is what a change might look like that's actually increasing binary size because I'm getting real work done, right? I'm building a feature uh, that customers are going to use. I'm adding the ping method to the frob. And, you know, I, if I see this review go by and I don't really care about frobs and pings, I would just delete it because, okay, yeah, 2K for a new function, that looks pretty good. Like, not my, not my department, right? And, and also looks re seems reasonable. I might look at like which files are being changed or how many lines are changed, et cetera. But, but then if I see the next time around I see this go by and I'm like, hmm, why does Pong take like this much extra code? Like what are they doing, right? So you see these changes and these are, this kind of attracts some attention to the change and requires a little bit more thought about it. Um, so the kinds of things you're looking for is someone like unnecessarily copying objects around because this actually generates more code. Um, did they use kind of an overly a Baroque class design? Um, did they use a, like a header library that just pulled in a ton of other header libraries and like, you know, in four lines create 10K of output? Like that's possible. Um, or did they write a whole bunch of code that actually can be replaced by another library that we have that they should just call that other library? Um, so this is the kind of thing that you look for, or at least those kinds of size changes would catch my eye and the eye of other reviewers, and we would look for people adding complexity unnecessarily to the product. Of course, um, if you want your review to go quickly, you do a self-review, and one of, the th one of the guiding principles here that, that we uh, came up with is if there's two ways to do something, well, actually, in C++, there's usually like five ways to do something. But if there's two ways to do something and you're trying to choose between the two of them, a good, you know, a reasonable choice is, hey, which one generates less code? If they look as equally readable and you're not quite sure what to, which way to go, um, then this it can help you make that decision. So it's important to say here, like the rule is you should be measuring your code and we are actively measuring the product. but the measure is not the rule. It's not an overriding, you, you, can, you can check in code that increases size. Sometimes, sometimes an increase in size is actually a decrease in complexity. Um, there's a couple of these, uh, examples of that at, at work. Um, so here, back to the graph, what's this big, what's this yellow thing and why did it go way up? Um, well, that process was a 32-bit process for a long time and um, it didn't really need to be 64-bit. It could have kept running in 32-bit mode forever because it's small. But because everything else was compiled for x64, we just moved that to x64 so it's like everything else. So binary size was not a concern for that. We're actually reducing complexity in the system by keeping everybody with the same tool chain. Um, so another thing is that sometimes actually bind generates less code than lambda, not that all that often, but sometimes it does, it doesn't matter. We don't, we wanna get rid of bind. So get rid of bind, take the bigger lambda, that's cool. Um, RAI objects are sometimes bigger. Um, range base four can generate more code. Unique putter can generate more code than um, manual calls to free. Um, algorithms are kind of uh, a touchy one because uh, Sometimes they improve readability and sometimes they don't. And so in this, in the, when you're considering this or you're debating it in a review, um, measuring size can help you um, decide that. Although if the algorithm uh, does uh, improve readability significantly, then you know, it, uh, yet adds size, then um, that's acceptable. 
Um, also, if you're the first person to instantiate a template, um, you're obviously going to, you usually take some extra overhead for that. But that's fine because you're using, reusing code. Yes, Bob? Ah, uh, yeah. Have you switched to a later version that has a small string optimization? And if so, did that make a difference? Um, so Bob asked whether or not we've switched off of copy on write strings in GCC. And the answer is no. This, this code is all using copy on write strings. In fact, we're using copy on write strings today with much more modern compilers. Um, and I've measured the code size. I can't remember whether it's up or down because I was completely distracted by the fact that memory with uh, uh, small buffer optimized strings, memory is way up. So that's something that we're holding off on because our code runs plenty fast enough with copy on write. And um, it's an interesting question, but it, like I talked about it last year. <laughs> so you can, you can, the numbers, some of the numbers are in last year's talk. Okay. Um, et cetera. So, Sometimes a, the right thing to do is make the code bigger because you, it's easy to argue and everyone agrees that the complexity of the code is going down. All right, so this is all happening several years ago and while it was happening, while we were kind of doing this whole exercise, there was this thing that, that happened outside of VMware which was Compiler Explorer. And the thing about this is that, uh, or at least I started using it, the first thing that lots of people do when they go to Compile Explorer is they ask themselves, okay, how many lines are in the disassembly? Like, what does this generate? So basically, I sort of, that was kind of a reinforcing thing that I was seeing in the community was uh, that this is, you know, people care about this. It's something that we use to judge the quality of code, the quality of a library anyways. Um, and in fact, Jason in his talk in 2016 for the Commodore 64, a lot of it was about, hey, I've got this modern C++, and it generates like very little code, right? <laughs> so even though some of the machinery was complex, certainly the compiler is very complex, the fact that it, it generates something small gives us some sense that the overall system complexity is actually manageable. Um, so the other thing outside of VMware that happened much more recently, I think this is like last fall, is uh, Bloaty. And um, I don't know if people are familiar with it, but this is this crazy tool that can rip apart binaries and analyze them for size. Um, so, you know, so the basic thing is it gives you an idea of what all the sections are, and it does a more intelligent job of this than size, I think. And um, actually, I can make that a little bit bigger. Uh, then it can also um, break things down by translation unit. Um, and uh, it can uh, also do diffs, which is exactly what we were doing, except at much finer, finer detail. Um, and it can do, you know, sort of profiler style uh, hierarchical drill downs. So this is also, this is a great project. And this is also kind of confirmation that this is a metric that we care about. Um, and that we use to judge the quality of the software that we build. Um, okay, we have about 10 minutes left. So I wanna wrap up. Um, and back to the graph for a second. Anyone see what I wanna talk about next in the graph? Yeah, we wanna talk, what's going on here, right? Well, um, the reality is that kind of back to business as usual. Um, we kind of met our goal, everyone's kind of breathed a sigh of relief in some sense, and now like we're still doing it, we're still kind of keeping things under control, but the focus is really more on like adding features, um, extending the product, et cetera. Um, you know, I, I think this is okay, because actually in some sense, this, if, if we're keeping complexity under control and we're adding value, right, then that's, we're doing our job. Um, so I think this is kind of okay. And certainly we're in a much better position than we were many years ago. Yes, How Larry. How much did you beat your goal by? Oh, we pretty much beat the goal, <laughs> like by a few K, and then people started making it bigger. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think, you know, that maybe, maybe I'll say that it's, now it's going to be more, a little bit more cyclical. I can be optimistic about that instead of just keeping going up forever. Uh, so some of the future directions. Okay, so for me personally, Bloaty is a, is a big future direction because um, 
over the years, we built scripts around this, this uh, workflow. So I built scripts for Windows, and I built a script for, I built a script that did like the hierarchical um, analysis that like you could tell it, uh, take this function and split it out into assembly and like let me diff the assembly for this function. Um, but I, to me, Bloaty has like, Bloaty has much more infrastructure and it's a properly structured, structured project. So like I think the logical thing to do is if you were to do this today, you would wrap it around Bloaty. Um, uh, wrap scripts around Bloaty or start submitting pull requests to Bloaty. Um, and I think as a developer, Bloaty is the kind of tool that should be in your tool belt. Um, you may not use it every day like Compiler Explorer, but you should have it sort of in your path. Um, another future direction is obviously there's this question like, should we switch back to O2? Like, have we kind of gotten ourselves into a situation where we don't need the metric to be that reliable anymore? Um, and there are occasional gotchas. Like, in a recent compiler upgrade, I actually had a function slow down noticeably um, because the, the newer compiler optimized for size, uh, like, extremely and pessimized the function. Um, so okay, there's occasional gotchas like that. Most of the time, that hasn't been a problem. Um, yeah, on the other hand, at VMware, we have a bunch of products that really morally belong, should be compiled with OS. Because if you think about it, we're managing virtual machines um, and every bit of memory uh, and code space that we take up on the, on the machine is just taking headroom from the virtual machine, which is running the real workload that we care about. Um, and most of the CPU on the machine should be consumed by those virtual machines, not by our management software. Um, also, there's this argument that uh, uh, we don't, like, there's this question, should we build OS as a special developer build just for acquiring this metric, or should we build OS and build O2 for release builds that we actually deploy? There the argument, again, is like, that just builds a more complicated system, and then we have two different kinds of binaries that we have to work with. And so the argument is we should really choose one and stick to it. Um, and not create multiple ones. Um, on the other hand, um, we've had some success writing Clang plugins um, and using them just in a, in, we have Clang, we have Clang uh, canary builds and we in integrate plugins into those canary builds um, to check things that we want to check. Um, so we could imagine switching, getting size from the Clang builds. Um, Integrating all of this with our build system is not really a, uh, is not an obvious, a, an obvious thing. But these are some of the kinds of future directions and things that, um, that I'm thinking about. Yeah, Michael. Have you looked at the size if you build with Clang? Have I looked at the size with the, yeah, I, I've looked at the size that built with Clang and I'm pretty sure it does not build as small a binary as GCC. But again, the, the importance, the absolute number is not important. The only thing that's important is that, you know, we kind of defeat the inliner and keep the metric stable, right? So I don't think that, I don't think the, that's a problem. Um, the, the big problem with using Clang is we probably wouldn't be using it as our production compiler. And so that would create the Clang build that developers use to gather this metric and run a few plugins. It just adds complexity to the workflow. Um, so to sum up, um, managing complexity is part of the product lifecycle, right? And uh, building for size is a convenient proxy for that complexity. Because it's right there, it's a tool you're already using. Um, and everyone has access to it. And it, it, I, I believe, like, based on my experience, it is a meaningful proxy. So, and it, it, since it's right there, you can make it part of the edit and test loop. So you can get feedback in minutes or seconds. Um, and um, you can make it part of the review cycle so that people use that as a way to kind of, just like Git gives you uh, line count, line change counts, or your review tool probably gives you line, line change counts. You can also get this count for your review. Um, and ultimately, it will help you design your code 
I will help you make decisions about how you design your code and steer you away from complexity. So that's it. Questions? <laughs> yes, Roman. Yeah, yeah. So the question, so Roman's question is, did we try building different translation units with different, um, different sizes? Um, we do definitely have different parts, not of this particular binary, but different binaries that do build with O2. Um, and in the case of like this function that got um, noticeably slower with a compiler upgrade because of o OS, um, we did, I thought about, we did test with a pragma in there. In the end, we just changed the code to re-enable reasonable generation. Um, but yeah, I would either, I would probably be, I'd be more likely to use a, an optimization pragma on a set of functions in a file than interfere with the build system complexity. I don't know. Yes. So how did this size change affect your overall speed? Okay, so I covered that before. So the question was, how did the size change affect the overall speed? So it definitely is measurable in micro benchmarks, of course, right? Um, but when you measure the system, uh, when you do an integration test or a system test, the effects, we, f we found the effects to be in the noise of our systems. That's not going to be true. That's not going to be, uh, this thing is, you can think of it as like a, it's the protocol translator. In the ideal world, it's totally IO bound, right? Um, so it's not, um, it's, not a, it's not a high performance computing application, although there are parts of it that are kind of like that. But the parts that were high performance computing, they actually, that's where the algorithmic work came in. So the, the, algorithms are, the, the algorithms that are performance critical were just redesigned for locality, uh, you know, uh, like cache localities, of, you know, just removing extra work, doing cache locality, using better algorithms is far more important than the compiler optimization for speed. Bob? Seem like you're doing putting more effort into review and thinking about size. Did you find that the the, the introduction, the rate of introduction of new defects was lower because of this? So Bob's question was, do we think that this this um, reduced the rate of defect introduction? And my intuition is no. This is this is an orthogonal okay. attribute. I mean, yeah, maybe. No, yeah, no. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Sergey. <laughs> What is a complexity? So Sergey asked, what is a complexity metric? Well, I think there's a lot of possible complexity metrics. Um, this is just one, right? And the, the argument here, the, advantage, the argument here is that, well, it's, it's simple. And the tool that generates it is already the tool that you're using, right? I think there's lots of other complexity metrics that, that would apply. Um, but, you know, it's not driving to a metric is off, can be counterproductive, right? You're optimizing for the wrong thing, right? If you, sometimes you end up optimizing for the wrong thing. Um, so what, in this case, we just needed some approximate proxy for complexity. And, and with it, and, and one of the things is, it is hard to like, you have to explain to people, it's not a, it's not, it's not a rule, it's a tool, right? And so if the tool is telling you something you think is wrong, well, Throw the tool away for that change and do the right thing. Okay, we're done. Thanks a lot, guys.